Hey, Joe. Good to see hey, you. Joe, what happened, man? Good to see you, too, even though we're how many miles, 6,000 miles away from each other? Eight. I think it's more like eight, something wow. like that. It's a long way away. So um, for the people who are here, thank you very much for coming. This is week two. So, you know, we're seasoned pros by now. This is not a technical thing. This is going to be just talking about being humans and making records and doing stuff. So if you're going to ask him what, like, Mike Pre he used on a certain record, I don't know that we're going to get to that. But I did actually see an interesting question about drums earlier, which has nothing to do with gear other than the drums themselves. So we'll get into some of that later on. But I just I want to talk to Joe about his amazingly cool, long, and focused career. I think focused is a good way to put it. I mean, like my discography is stupid and there's like two of everything on there. Whereas you've been really, you've, you've been in your genre pretty much your entire career, but it's not all you listen to. And yeah, right. another thing we're gonna yeah. do later, we're gonna share some playlists. Um, we did this last week with Matt, but now we've got names for him because I had time to think. So we've got The Inspiration, which is 10 songs Joe loves, and The Perspiration, which is 10 songs Joe's worked on. And we'll talk specifically about a couple of those later. But first of all, I just wanted to start right away, if you're cool with it, Joe. I want to share a picture of Joe and I, and this would be probably five years after we first met. So this is in LA. And this is Christmas, Christmas of uh, 1991. Oh, man, maybe. <laughs> so in case, you, in case you can't tell who's who, I'm on the left in the weird white shirt and Joe's on the right with some very long hair, which we'll get to. And also, as you pointed out, the very short shorts. So we'll stop. Thank you, shorts, man. That was, my, that was my repertoire back then. <laughs> yeah, man, that was everybody. And there's another picture from the same day with uh, Rich Tonus and Stephen Toback and Debbie and Jake, my son, who at the time was six months old. So Drinking, drinking a Foster's, right? Yes, yes. With a, wasn't open, obviously, but we gave him the beer Foster's and he grew it. It was yep. awesome. Stroller. In the store. So I met you at University of Miami, um, but you went to, was it University of South Florida first? I went to South Florida for a year and a half. And yeah. Studied and, guitar. and then came to UM to study engineering. And we don't have to talk about your thoughts on, on any of that. But you the, went to study classical guitar with Juan Mercadal. I was at a crossroads in my life where I was like, they did away with the music program, the, the engineering program at USC. And so uh, I was like, I didn't really know what to do. So Juan Mercadal, famous Cuban guitar player, was the, the chairman of the classical department at UM. So I ended up going down there, auditioned with like D from Randy Rhodes, played some, some metal on nylon string guitar and got in the program. And then it kind of just fell into place like that. So. So you came down as a performance major, not an engineering major. I was an engineering major, yeah. It just kind of turned into, it was kind of everything. Oh, what, other, what other class am I going to take? I'm not going to you know, wear a tuxedo and play in the lounge at a, at a hotel for the rest of my life, which I was trying to do back then. But it, uh, it was it was actually pretty fun. So but learning about engineering was, I mean, I, I assisted you at Gusman Hall on some stuff. Yeah. You know, there was... The, the tools were there, you just had to use them. And uh, you were one of the few that used them, actually. <laughs> I couldn't, you couldn't get me out of that place. I don't exactly. think I slept for four years. That's it, man. We can come in and go to school till three and then go in and do sessions from five to 10 and then all night from 10 to 9 yeah. a.m. back to school again. It's crazy. Yeah, yeah, the studio was available from 5 p.m. until 8 a.m. during the week and 24 hours on weekends. And you booked it in five hour chunks. So the worst was the three to eight because you couldn't go to bed early and then get up to get to the studio for three a.m. So you just stayed up all night and then you went straight to a class. Yeah, the coffee vials of Cuban coffee we used to buy on the street corner was yeah, That's yeah, the and, and, the, uh, and the Round John Donuts as well. Mm -hmm. What was the name of the donut place? Um, um, and with the pizza, it was the the pizza joint. I remember that <laughs> with the garlic knots. Exactly. Oh, so. Yeah. 
So that was that was basically 35 years ago, which is kind of scary because that means we were 10 when we met because we're very young right now. Sorry, I'm just getting a, a cup of coffee that my lovely wife, Debbie, who is in one of the other pictures, which we're not going to show, was in. But so by the time you finished at Miami, you were going to be making records. I mean, you decided you weren't going to try and be a, a performing musician already at that point, or you had all your options? Yeah, I was, it was either all or none for me. I, I had enough of playing in bands at that point. And I came out here for an AES show. I'm in LA, I came out to LA for an AES show. They're playing Iron Maiden on the radio. It was KNAC back then. And I was like, where else are you gonna live, man? The weather's great. <laughs> so <laughs> I didn't finish my last internship and came out and got a gig and started working. And, and uh, that's, it was, that was the start right there. Basically. And where did you start at Cherokee, or was there something before Cherokee? Started at Cherokee, yeah. I, uh, I started because we learned about soldering at UM. So the the whole fixing of gear stuff. I started try, uh, soldering A range modules in the back, and I wanted to be an assistant, but they had to go through a program to be an assistant there. And then, and one day, all the assistants got up and quit because they were all on salary and they were working hundred hour weeks for two bucks, and uh, and basically they all quit. So I was like, hey. I'm here. I'm going to be an assistant. And they're like, no, we have to go through the program. I'm like, oh, forget it, man. So at that point, I, I'd been preparing guitars at night, too, working during the day and preparing guitars at night. So I ended up uh, starting to freelance, paid some money, and went and took a class at USC for uh, learning how to use an SSL. And met a guy named Dick McGilvery who hired me at his studio and then worked at Sound City where Toback was working. He called and said, our, our tape machine is not working. Can you be the tape op? I'm like, sure. And, uh, and, um, uh, that that was it. Just kind of freelance assisting. So were you, so you were never actually on staff at Sound City. It was all just freelance. It was all freelance. I mean, I I, I worked there mostly, but then right. I would talk to the band and go, "Hey, there's a there's a room down the street where I work also that you can do overdubs in if you're not going to stay here." Yeah, we were going to go to so and so's place. I'm like, "No, you're going to go here instead." And then we work at preferred sound for a month doing overdubs I'm like well, where are you gonna mix well we don't know yet hey check out this other studio i work at called cornerstone or pacific and then we'd go mix over there and i'd end up on a whole record in all these different studios that i worked at just by and then i kind of had my own clients that way essentially I just i saw it from from beginning to end but it was really cool just learning different rooms and doing that as an assistant is almost unheard of i mean that's crazy to be following a project around that's great well, it was also some places I was the janitor and the maintenance guy and the, the runner, you know, I mean, we were, we were working at smaller studios where we were the only guy. So we literally take a break and I'd run down and go get hamburgers and then come back and then, oh, the headphones broke. Okay. While well, you guys are eating, I'll solder some headphones. And, you know, it, it was, it was kind of good, man. You fly by the seat of your pants and it was, it was way more interesting to work a 12 hour day than just to sit on the couch and read a paper or something. Was, yeah. Absolutely. So what was what was your first sort of big record you got to work on and who was it with? Who was producing and engineering? I think there was a few moments in my life that were interesting. But the, I mean, the biggest one to me was was Garth Richardson because he had uh, done the first Rage record. Yeah. It hadn't come out yet. You know, it wasn't big or it had just come out. It didn't blow up yet. So he, he was always going to Sound City as a client and, you know, you'd call and say, hey, I've worked here a million times. Can I get three days to do a demo? And and usually the studio manager would, would uh, oblige the producer and, and Garth was in there for three days and his normal guy didn't want to do it for free. So I was like, man, I'll do it. So I worked with Garth for three days for free. We did a demo with a band called Little Gods. And um, I'm still friends with Manny Nieto. He's an engineer producer as well. He was a guitar player in that band. All right. And um, and at that point, after that, Garth's like, well, that was awesome, man. Thank you for doing that. Three days of free free labor. Next time I come back, uh, I will give you some extra money and you're my new assistant here. And then after that, we're going over here. We're going to A&M to mix. Why don't you come with us and help us mix? There's another whatever. And that, and that kind of really started it for me. And Jason Cassar was the other one. He, he had done some Masters of Reality at Sound City, and I was his assistant. And we became friends, and he would fly me to New York. I'd live with him, and we'd work on records. Or he would come out here to do Duran Duran or, or Traffic or whatever. And, you know, right. yeah, give me some money, come and help me out. Man, 
That's and we 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 both sort of stood. I mean, you'd heard most of the stories from Garth anyway, but I hadn't heard him firsthand. But listening to him talk about making that first Rage record at uh, um, was just amazing. Just listening to that video camera recording. Oh, God, was, man, when they're just guys, it was my I had not seen that footage before. So the the band was tracked live in the room, and that's all four of them in the room. The amps. Timmy's rig wasn't in the room, but Tom's was, right? Is that what it was, or was Timmy's in there as well? I think they were all separated, but he had brought a PA in. So he brought this Meyer PA in. And yeah, I think what they tried to do as a normal record at first, but it, it wasn't exciting enough. So they decided to set up it like a live show. And then they had, for two nights in a row, they invited all their friends down. And they basically had a crowd in the studio. The amps were on the sides separated but the pa was in the room and they just went for it live like they were going to play a stage show, you know, show on stage and that's the energy of the bed tracks that they captured yeah and that's exactly a lot of the vocals in the control room in front of the the big speakers in sound city and that's pretty bold i mean because garth he'd been working but he wasn't that established at that point was he i mean he he was right we, he 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 comes first of all, you know. Garth comes from a history of um, of music, so his dad was yeah. producer, so so he's always been involved and very musical. And, and um, he has been working with Michael Wagner, and Wagner had done some huge records. And um, I think you know at that point, Michael was either too busy to do like he got a demo tape to do Rage or something, and turned turned it on to Garth, just like Garth's dad turned Bob Resin on to Alice Cooper, you know that kind of thing. And, and so Garth made. A ton of records, but no, I don't think you had produced a ton of records yet, and that was right. you know, his first big production. That's awesome. Now, for the, the people watching this, we're throwing names out there like Michael Wagner. Like, you guys need to go look these people up. Just have a right. second to go open and look on Wikipedia, or write them down for later. Or, but this All is the history of yeah. making records. Yeah, I mean, they're in our days. We used to read, you know, LPs, and and I remember just, you know, you buy albums sometimes based on the guy who made them. Martin yeah. Birch, another one, you know, anything Martin Birch did was like the holy grail. So you you pick up an album and you you never heard of the band, and you look at the back and it's produced by Martin Birch. You're like, all right, I'll take it, you know. And then you would never be disappointed because he was your hero at that point or whoever, you know. For me, anyway, it was all the 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 guys that did, you know, the Deep Purples and the the sabbaths and the zeppelins and the, yeah guys. and you'd saved up to buy the record and it's the only record you had to listen to for a week until you had money to from your allowance to buy another record so yeah listen to a sequence of eight to ten songs in a row flip the side over while you're listening you're kind of studying the artwork yeah the lyrics, you know it's where did they record it there's your education right there recorded at rockfield Wow, there was another record I bought a couple months ago. We go to Rockfield Queen or whatever, you know, and then you you yeah. start creating these sounds in your brain, and it, it became just like I mean, just like you would buy an album because it was recorded in a certain place. You would buy stuff that was done at Abbey Road because the Beatles were done at Abbey Road, you know. Yeah, absolutely. So, when was your sort of move into full time engineering from assisting, or was it sort of? a slow back and forth process um wow that man there was like a couple things one i remember doing a band called rhythm tribe it was a family that played like flamenco almost like uh i can't even think of the name of the band right now but um they were just really nice their dad was involved the two brothers blah blah, blah. they had an engineer they didn't get along with the engineer there was a lot of bickering and fighting going on and I remember going out and getting some food and coming back and go, where's so-and-so? They're like, we fired him. You're the engineer. So that was one of the first, like, there you go. You're the assistant. Now you're the engineer. There's been a few of those, you know, or you're the, uh, you know, the engineer is working all day and then we need to do guitar solos. So what do you think? Okay, I'll be here from 12 to 8 in the morning doing solos. And then I'll be your assistant from noon till 10 at night or whatever. It's just, so there's a few of those, but um, it, it came down to a point where I had been doing a lot of engineering, but no production. And that that breakthrough, or just being the mixer, you know, you'd engineer something, you hand it off to a famous mixer and they would do it. And 
You're always yeah. the engineer, they're the mixer. And, and at some point, I would talk to Allred Wild, who worked with Terry Date, and um, he had started producing his own stuff. And Terry Date's amazing and done some insanely great records. And, and I'm like, how do you make the change from, from being the, the engineer to a famous guy to being your own producer? And he goes, you, just have, to, you have to be confident enough not to work. Just stop engineering. And that's yeah. what he basically said to me. So then I, I would get phone calls that said, hey, do you want to engineer this? And I, I would go, wow, man, that's an insane amount of money or whatever at the time. But I would say, no, unless I get to mix it. Because then at least I'm the mixer as well. Sometimes it's a little more respected than just, just, you know, just being the engineer or a potential of making some decent money on points if you're able to get points. And then at some point, uh, I would turn down stuff unless I was the producer as well. So you basically, you know. You basically, it's like going to Vegas. You're just like, I really want to do this. I mean, I, I, you know, first Queen's record was was basically turning down an insane amount of money working on something kind of music that I might not enjoy at all, but the payday was well, well great. Or going to hang out with guys that I knew and making a record for no money because it was money and music that I liked. So I was like, screw it, man. I'm just kind of, I'm going to go hang out with those guys and make a record. That that Queens record is on my list of stuff to talk about. So if you want to talk a little bit more about you know how you knew the guys from Caius and like the scene before and how Queens like was Queens a new band project before they even started the record or did it turn into Queens of the Stone Age as it happened and just how you were involved and what how it was made too because it was a there weren't a lot of records being made sort of in the destination way at that point really. Mm -hmm. so. Well, because I was working at Sound City quite a bit, and Chris Goss from Masters of Reality did a lot of work at Sound City. There was a guy who was a house engineer named Brian Jenkins, who was kind of like the, me and Brian were both like house engineers at Sound City, basically. And he was he was above me, so he had always got the gigs, and I would take up the leftovers. But at some point, he had done a record that got really big. Um, and he started breaking out of Sound City and not being the house engineer anymore. He started engineering for other producers. And so he would set up. So on, on Caius did Blues for the Red Sun and Sky Valley and Circus Leaf Town, mostly of Circus Leaf Town at, at uh, Sound City. So Brian would set up day one, like how Chris liked it. And then I would be the house, I would be the engineer. So I had this relationship. We did Blues for the Red Sun in uh, 10 days total six days in Studio A, recording it, four days in B, mixing it. And then we did Sky Valley uh, in 14 days, seven days in Sound City Studio A, mixed it at NRG, Studio A there in seven days. And then Circus, um, I tracked at Sound City and Brian actually mixed it at A&M. So I'd already known those guys and we had a relationship and, and they're they're from you know from the desert. And so they're they're not very LA guys. They're just, they're down to earth and they, they're, you know, very musical and very into their art. So we had a nice relationship to, to even the point where John Garcia and I would be the only guys in the room while he was singing because he felt comfortable. And he was also, um, you know, he's not a flamboyant person at all. He's very, very soft spoken and he would be comfortable just with me in the room. So, so we had a relationship anyway. Um, so Josh, at that point, guys broke up. Josh moved to Seattle. He was playing in bands with Alfredo, the drummer from Queens, and, and Kim Thiel was involved at some point with some things. And, and um, he just had a band. And, and there was another singer. He was an ever a singer. And, and they had done some demos for Roadrunner. And, and basically, I got a call from him one day saying, nobody wants to sign my band. Um, I just want to make a record. And so I have a little bit of cash. We'll go out to the desert. We'll go to Joshua Tree Rancho. So... I listened to the music. He sent me a, a cassette and I first put the first line on. It was Mexico. And I'm like, I'm in. Turned down $36,000 worth of some other gig. And I was like, let's do it, man. So we went out to uh, Rancho, which wasn't, there was a bass player in the band at the time. So it was a three piece. It was Josh, the bass player, and, and Alfredo playing drums. And it didn't quite work out. In four days, I kind of packed up my stuff and split. I was like, this is not happening. Um, so, so Josh. So what wasn't happening it was it was mainly the bass player wasn't very happening and there wasn't really a singer 
and and the studio was kind of in its transforming stage so it wasn't quite i couldn't really interface my gear not that i had a ton of gear at the time but i brought in some some mic pre some cal Rex, and things like that it was hard to interface because it was very much a home studio you know it was the ranchos it was uh which is a great place to record and super nice and an amazing environment but it, i just couldn't get what the sounds that i was hearing in my head in that room with that band and with that bass player at the time and so um so i split which sucked it's, it was a tough drive home but then josh called a couple of weeks later and said look i'm going to play bass and we're going to cut it in palm springs at this other studio that chris goss was involved in and um, he had brought a friend of his in from buffalo named steve feldman and they had um, a soundtracks console and decent little mic mic pre collection a couple of cal racks uh, a little bank of Neves and stuff and 3M tape machine, which is my first 3M experience. And so I was like, all right, let's come out. I brought Bruce Jacoby with me as a drum tech. Nice. And, you know, I mean, it was basically an industrial little warehouse. It wasn't even really set up as a proper studio. I mean, to the point where we were stapling packing blankets on the wall to deaden stuff and recording guitars in a, in a kitchen. And the, the bit Josh played bass, they cut it live as a two piece with Josh and Alfredo. And uh, I, I just remember, man, just trying to punch on a 3M machine was impossible. So coming out would always wipe the next beat. You know, so I started getting to the point where I would actually cut the tape, put a leader in, and yeah. then I would record to the leader and then slap it back together. Or I'd say, you know what, the whole song from the first chorus out could be better. So punch in at the first chorus and play to the end. And the whole thing with pitch and and uh, and you know it's like very much like a turntable the the, the strobe the, the speed of the tape machine use a strobe light yeah and so that yeah, that record cut. logic for tape you know played back that this over and over and that so that that was it I mean it was basically seventeen eighteen days and uh, the thing about the band to me was the first time Josh sang too so it was uh, it was his falsetto was coming in. And he was experimenting with being a singer. And so there was that kind of uh, sincerity. And the grooves were just insane between the two guys playing. I mean, basically all the bass was reamped because the, the amp blew up. So I used the Sovtech and reamped all the bass. And I had, they had JL Cooper automation. And I had first added the, the foresight to see that the, the, the automation, when you insert it, it changed the sound completely. So I cut it with the automation in the whole time so I could get the sound through the automation so it wouldn't be completely different later. All right, and so DAs versus analog, like just true faders? Yeah, well, it was, it was, there was some computer faders, but you inserted it. So as soon as you put the, the 16 channels of automation, it was going through their circuitry as well. Right. It completely changed the sound. So. So I cut the record on a 24 track with 16 tracks of GL Cooper inserted the whole time on stuff I knew I was going to move. And I also wanted it to sound completely different. So I mixed it on a pair of EV Sentries because I was like, if I mix on something I know, it's going to sound exactly like I want it to sound. So I'm going to fight to make it sound like something different by mixing on something different. And wow. it was kind of unique. You know, it was a weird, it was a weird time, but, uh, it was fun. That was the thing. It was, it was no one, we didn't have any expectations. No one might sign in. We all did it for nothing. You know, it was maybe $200 a day or something like that involved. And it was crazy. That's awesome, man. And it worked out, you know. Well, it worked out. Yeah. I mean, you know, it, it kind of, it turned into, I don't know, I think I've worked on four records, but even at that point though, you know, I mean, I, I had done the record. I brought them to Geffen at that point because I had done some stuff with Weezer and Todd Sullivan. And, but record labels like, who the fuck is Joe Barisi, man? We don't know that guy. We, we got to hire a producer for your next record. We'll sign you. So they signed him and they hired Chris Goss because he had produced records. And then yeah. the next one, Josh came to me and said, I want you to do songs for the deaf. But Interscope was like, we don't even know that name. So he's out. We're getting some name dude in there who didn't end up finishing it off anyway. And uh, I think Adam Casper finished it. And uh, and that's that's the way it is. So I ended up working on Lullabies and Aravel Garris and various odds and ends after that. But the first one is still a special 
was like being in the trenches, you know, if you're in a war, you're just like, remember that time in the battle of Bla and, <laughs> there was it. Uh, wow. And of course, I think Interscope knows who you are now. They don't care now. <laughs> but yeah, exactly. I mean, who cares Nick, in a way, you know. Nick didn't join the band till the very end. That actually answer machine message on the end of the record was the message that he left when John <laughs> called and said, oh, shit, man, I need a bass player now. There's only two of us. So, <laughs> I'm going to call Nick from Queens, uh, from Caius, and that's when Nick joined the band. So he didn't actually play on the first record. It's only Josh and Alfredo on the whole album. Well, Josh is, he's a fan of that anyway, isn't he? Because I mean, some of the later records he played a lot, didn't he? Or was it always the band? Lullabies, they switched completely. Every every song was, okay, Troy's gonna play bass, Alan's gonna play guitar, Josh will play guitar. This song, maybe Josh will play bass and Troy and Alan will play guitar. So it was, it was I was actually thinking about this about a week ago because um, I've been working on different records and, and like if you read Beatles stuff, they always talked about rehearsing in the room. They might rehearse for hours and then cut the song in two takes. And now you kind of, you you don't rehearse at all. You basically try to cut it and you keep piecing it together. You know what I mean? And it, it just turns into that thing. But yeah. lullabies was one of those things where you might spend a whole day getting the sound of the band together. And then once it was together, you would play it twice and the song was done. It was right. like easy. So it took four weeks to make a record, but it wasn't like you were doing overdubs at all, except for the vocals. It was it was really live. Okay, cut this. until it was everything it needed to be. Yeah, yeah. Change guitars. You know, I remember, I remember walking into Sound City and watching Billy Bowers do Frank Black live, and just going, "Oh man, how's this guy? The vocal's not loud enough. Oh, he's stepping up. <laughs> so, <laughs> hang on a second. Can you get a little closer to the mic on that harmony? Yeah, no problem. It, it was amazing watching guys play live like that. I mean, like both Caius and Queens. Insane. Yeah. Wow. Now, just to get it out of the way, because I'm sure there have already been 30 questions about it. Um, was the was Lullabies the one where the cymbals were cut separate? Yeah. First time ever I've done that in my life. First and last. Yeah. It, it's become a thing where every band in the world likes to do it. Like in here... There's even a different name for it. Oh God, what's it called? Skins and uh, I can't even remember what. Like, there's a whole phrase for the cutting the drum separate thing. But they did it once as an experiment. Like, and it was a sonic choice, right? He wanted to have more control over the symbols for the mix. Yeah. They, well, they've done it on every record except the first record. So first record, oh, really? live, live drum kit, normal. They did it on rated R and out. So oh, I didn't realize that. I thought that it was only on lullabies. No, every record, but but the reason he does it is because Josh doesn't like cymbals, and he likes room. And obviously, when you're playing heavy and you're beating cymbals, your room is full of cymbals. So the beauty of doing it is being able to mic a tom from eight inches away or a foot away and getting that space. So so the way we did it was we'd set the drum kit up like normal, dial in a drum sound, and then just take the cymbals off. So then Joey Castillo would play kick, snare, and toms. And was he hit the leg or, or something? Or? Well, to keep time, we tried to integrate electronic pads. So we'd put a pad in there and have a hi-hat sound. That way you can hear a hat. But he's such a, a heavy drummer that he would eat through these pads like nobody's business. So at some point, we're like, hey, man, we don't have any more pads. So you're going to have to hit your leg or something. And then we put the cymbals back on and pull all the drums out. And that, that was much easier because he's playing, but, you know, he's hitting his thigh for a snare drum and you can use his foot as a kick, but he was actually playing. So the, the phase was actually pretty accurate because it was the same picture of the drum kit originally, right. just done in two parts. And he was a remarkable drummer because it's very difficult to play musically. It's just like, oh, like a full drum kit. It's one thing if you're over in a hat or over in a ride, but, He's yeah, actually yeah. top to bottom like that. Yeah, it's really, really hard. I mean, I've been made to try it with bands a couple of times. And you realize as soon as you start doing the cymbal overdub that it just feels terrible. Yeah. It's, I mean, you think like, oh, crashes. I mean, hat, forget about it. But even just crashes. There's something about the timing with the foot and the crash that if it's not the same, it just is. Right. It's like, right. 
you have to be musical enough to know that there's a flam there a lot of times. And that's, you know, that these days gets edited out, you know, just you yeah. know, the head of the beat, let me put it on the beat or the symbols behind the beat. But realistically in the drum kit itself, I mean, Mark Dernley, who's a famous English engineer, has done some of the greatest records of all time, in my opinion. Worked with ACDC, worked with uh, Crocus, worked with Loudness, worked with Uriah Heep. He's done some insane stuff. He's, he's a guy who kind of explained it to me early on in life. And he said, on a, on a piece of tape, you have 30 inches a second if you're going at 30 IPS. So in this 30-inch piece of tape, he goes, the kick drum is right here. And he goes... The bass player is probably a little behind the beat, so he's over here. The guitar player is always ahead of the beat, so he's up here. And this downbeat is huge. And then you get in the box and you start shifting things around. And now all of a sudden the kick is here, the bass is here, the guitar is here, and the downbeat is this big. So you have to have the, use your, you know, use your ears or the foresight to know that there's imperfections in the music itself, but that's what makes it bigger. You know, so even, even when it comes down to tuning and things like that, I'm like, Sounds like I remember us trying to tune cutting the bass on medication two or three times on that on lullabies and just going, screw it, man. It just it feels good. It's slightly out of tune. Who cares? You know, but now they, you would just look at it and go, oh, shit, I got to melodyne that thing, man, you know. But back then, you're like, ah, F it. Yeah, well, there's nothing you can do. There's yeah. nothing. But, but also, I mean, on, on the flip side of that, there are people who were doing guitars one string at a time so that it'd be perfectly in tune on tape. You know, Mutt Lang's famous for doing that. And yeah. so the, the meticulous thing didn't start with Pro Tools. It just allowed everybody to be meticulous. Whereas it yeah. used to be like yeah. a real. Mutt Lang used to use, I heard 24 channels of AMS and used to just physically start moving stuff forward and back for timing. One of my, yeah, it, the story I heard was that they had, yeah, 24, so it was 48 channels because they were all stereo and because the track was on a 3348. And so every track is going through an AMS on the way to the console. And he'd, they'd go around, they'd tweak, they'd move stuff, move stuff. And when they finished, like 46 of them had the same setting on them. But, but, but you know, but he was going to, he was going to go down that rabbit hole big time. I, I actually, when I first heard that story, it started making me think like that, though. That's the beauty of the stories. You know, you're just like, you don't realize why Phil Rudd sounds so good in ACDC compared to the Chris Slade or compared to a different drummers. But in the end, you might go, OK, it's where he places his hi-hat, you know. So so just being aware of those things as you're making records. I, I Believe me, I couldn't make a record now without a computer. I love it. I love the ability to do things that we could never do on a tape machine. Yeah, but at the same time, I'm not, I'm not trying to fix stuff unless it's mandatory. Like for me, just we would never um, tune stuff. And, and like, if you put harmonies on, you're like, oh, cool. I mean, you listen to the Beatles, this shit's out of tune. But but you know, so I go always go in with the approach of making a record like we did it on the days where you know there was tape and. We only have 24 tracks. Sorry, that's it. You're done. You know, unless we were locking something up or dragging an eight out along with it. So, I still yeah. try to. Do that. I don't always end up doing that, but I still try to approach it like that. But the computer is unbelievable, and being able to isotope noise out of a, a yeah. humbucker strap pickup or whatever, and making it dead quiet like a humbucker is like phenomenal to me because those things bother the hell out of me now. You know, when I hear noise, I go. Huh. I don't mind hiss as much, but in a beautiful guitar solo where it's something sustaining and all you hear is buzz, I'm like, ah. Exactly. So you can easily fix the stuff that you always wish you could have fixed, but yeah. it's not you go looking for it. We tried anyway back then. I mean, we used to try to use bare denoisers and all kinds of weird stuff. We're like, how do we expand this? Just yeah, yeah. Or, or get the guitar player like, okay, don't move. Don't. Exactly. Making tape uh, I was on the floor where the headstock should point this way because that's the quietest spot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, those were not the days. Those were not the days at all. Um, so we got to talk about your studio because it's completely insane. Because, I mean, for years and years and years, you did not have a studio. Even when people started setting up, I mean, I had a, a room at my house 
long before you, I mean, as far as I know, you didn't yeah. really, you never set up at home. You were always working in commercial studios, right? Yeah, I mean, I had gear because everything, I, every penny that I made always, we'd buy gear. You're like, why am I renting this ant from this guy? I can put the $300 back in the budget and work an extra couple hours or whatever. So we used to buy gear. So I had a ton of gear. And uh, I just rack mounted it and stored it mates. And then if I were working at Sound City, I'm like, okay, there's, you know, 20 channels of Neve here. I don't need any Neve stuff. So I would just, you know, email those guys and say, bring these cases and whatever. And they, they would they would just show up if I was mixing somewhere. And that, that to me, it was convenient because I didn't really want to make the plunge into, you know, it's a commitment, obviously. And, and being in your house is the ultimate to me because you got to pay your mortgage anyway. But I, my yeah. house was small and um, it just didn't, I didn't really have, it was, you know, I've tried like actually on 10,000 days, we did a, a segue piece in my house. So I had the whole guy, all the four guys in tool here and made his kid on the couch watching TV. And we're, we're working in the bedroom trying to do these voiceovers and stuff. And I'm like, well, this is kind of cool. It's just still weird that people are in my house, you know? So it was never, um, it was never, I couldn't do it here. I could have built out, but I'm not, I'm not like, um, like there are many handy people. I'm sure you're, you're handy with a saw. And Matt Wallace is another one. He could build a house himself, but I can't even put a cat door in. So I'm like, I did put a cat door in. I put two cat doors in. I've done uh, that, but I couldn't buy it. Down, I'll pay your ticket for another. <laughs> we can get Eric to, to be able to like wander in and out on his own. Nice. But, yeah, you can get the chip activated ones. It's awesome to keep the other animals out. That's what I need to do because he's a fighter. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So yeah. I was actually working at, a, at the village with David Kahn. And he was, we were working on Kelly Clarkson and the Jason and, and um, another guy in the band, a guitar player. I can't think of his name right now. They had a studio in Pasadena. They were leasing, subleasing from, turns out they're subleasing it from M Audio. And at some point it was um, M Audio got it from the same family as owned it forever. And it was Kevin Gilbert's studio. It was the Thursday Night Music Club. Down the street was Bill Betrell's place, Tuesday Night Music Club. And that's where Cheryl Crow and Kevin Gilbert and his band wrote all these songs for her first album, basically. And um, and at some point they they were going to get rid of the lease. And and actually, Billy Bowers, or no, Paul Fig and Miles um, from Sound City took it over, and they were they had a thing going with Frank Black for a while in there. And then um, they wanted out, so I took it over. I've been there thirteen years now, so. It's it's not really a proper studio. It's just a room that's kind of. It's cutting. pretty. It's pretty proper. Well, I mean, you know, as far as properly treated or anything, not really. But but here's the crazy part: is uh, uh, the the drummer in the band came by to visit one day. It was a Kevin Gilbert band. He told me how much Kevin loved Hugh Pageant. <coughs> Excuse me. Got to stay. Kevin loved Hugh Pageant and. Um, he flew to the townhouse in London and measured the room, the brick room that you worked in. So when he came back, he made the room that I record in the same dimensions. And purely by coincidence, I own the console that came out of the other room in the townhouse. So it's 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 actually you know chilling to know that it's come around like that. But yeah. well, and that you have the only things left of the townhouse space. <laughs> Yeah, basically. That's it. So 13 years, man. That's insane. That's insane. We've I've been lucky enough to record some overdubs over there with you. Um, and it's yeah, brilliant. Great sounding live room. Really great. Like you can you can choke it down if you want to, but why would you? Because it just sounds great. You know, it's so weird. Sometimes I'm mixing and I go, man, this 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 backing vocal part sounds really cool and roomy. And I realize it's my room. I'm going, man, it's already built in. It's a very unique sound. So it's it's one of those things where you go, it sounds like that while you're in there. And it's, it's just weird for me, but I try to use as much of it as I can. When even when I'm mixing, I was always pumping stuff through, you know, just. Right. So do you use it as a chamber while you're mixing? I use it as a chamber, as a place to reamp guitars, as a, put the Leslie in there. There's always, the room mics are always going. So if I need right. something. 
you know, you know, how do you make stuff you sound unique? You just got to use unique spaces. So while a lot is it of the being, stuff on the wall? Are those your your room mics? The PCMs on the the PCMs on the back wall go through the console talkback compressor, malted down to one, and then there's two mics, four fourteens against the the other wall, super high up, and then uh, occasionally there's other stuff, um, something on the floor. You know, in the middle of the room, I try a little bloom line thing. Maybe the the new pipe bomb periscope mic is going to be next. Yeah, man. <laughs> we'll see. So I want to get some questions from other folks, but I, I got to talk about the two playlists you sent me just a tiny bit. So the first right. one, your inspiration playlist. There's a lot of stuff that's like you would think, like killing in the name off the first Rage record. Some UFOs, some Scorpions, Thor, not as well known, but still pretty badass and in the genre. But there's one on there. Well, there are two on there, actually. The first track on the list is Life and Rain by Remy Zero. Mm -hmm. Now, Remy Zero is an LA band, and they kind of almost started to do something and then didn't really. But you want to talk about that song a little bit, just why you like it, why it's on the list. And Mark's going to share the link to these uh, these playlists for you guys. Well, you know, what, I mean, when you there's always music that you listen to and you just go, this is one of the most amazing sounding things, whether it's the vocal sound or the bass sound or, you know, it may not have anything to do with, with anything. I mean, Mulder, Alan Mulder, I think my friend Chad used to work with him as well. I've worked with him. Um, said he used to reference Scrubs by TLC or something for low end or something like that. You know, I don't know how true that is, but, but you always like, you always have something that you listen to. And, and that particular song, Alan Mulder actually mixed that record. But I remember asking him about that song, and that song was mixed by David Bottrell, who produced that album, who also did the Tool stuff before me. And um, to me, that I was like, how do you, how would you even remix that? This is like one of the most perfect sounding songs ever. So, so, and then obviously he didn't. He goes, no, I couldn't. You couldn't beat that. That was it was done. So that's the one song that Bottrell mixed on the record. Did they make that before he tried, or did he did he put up and see what he could do first? I, you know, I don't remember exactly. I, I want to say when Alan might have told me. I think Alan might have tried it, but I don't know. I don't honestly don't know. Not, Alan. From what I know about Alan, I mean, he would try absolutely everything. So you'd think. He is like the most level-headed, cool, down-to-earth dude. You're like, hey, Alan, the console's on fire. That's cool. Um, I'm going to replace this kick drum. You know, he's that, that mild-mannered and mellow. It's just amazing. And very musical, but yeah, uh, and very nice as well. But I, I remember asking him, and I, I believe he didn't do it because he was like, "Where do you go from there?" You know what I mean? Like it, it, it is yeah. a great mix, and it, it's an interesting band. The vocals are super loud, but they're in your face the whole time. But there's so much depth in that mix, and there's so much stereo stuff going on, and every section changes. You hear something, you hear the record scratch, you hear the almost digital H three thousand tremolo -y reverb effect on the guitars. It's, it's really interesting. So I put that up for that. And uh, the other one's probably Duran Duran on there. No, no, that's I'm fine with Duran Duran. I'm curious. Now, Genesis, I'm a huge Genesis fan, but Follow You, Follow Me of all the songs. I'm curious, why is that one on the list? It's, to me, it's, it's, um, it's interesting how the melody is reinforced by the keyboard line. And it's even crazier to me that it's a three-piece band at that point. You know, there's no Peter Gabriel. Yeah. And, and so Phil Collins's vocals always intrigued me because they're so smooth, but they're always so affected. And every time I try to make a voice double, I just go, what? Well, it sounds wacky. But he, they get away with it. And the drum sounds are so insane on that record. And, and actually on any Phil Collins record after that. So he... The stuff that Hugh Pageant was doing and, and whoever else recorded um, some of the earlier stuff, it's just mind blowing to me. So it's on there because it's, and it's, and it's got some interesting ethnic kind of parts happening, but, but they're probably done like with normal stuff. It's just not, they're not bringing in like, you know, vibes players or anything, but it's, 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 it's an interesting song. It's a cool sounding record. It's one, it's one cool thing about that band is, and even when Peter was still in the band, is that they never really had a bass player. So they were switching instruments all the time. I mean, Rutherford played bass 
like some of the greatest bass tones on Lamb Lies Down on Broadway, things like that. But he never played bass live, really. He's a guitar player. And so it, they were always in that mindset of covering extra stuff and like big building block stuff. Just and every record sounds different. You know, that's yeah. the other thing. Just even like, yes, it's the same thing. You know, you're, you're dealt with the same players. You might say Chris Choir has the same bass sound every time, but every record just sounds different to me. Yeah. Um, and with those, you get the same engineer and producer. I mean, Eddie Offord did almost all of them. Yeah. Yeah. And amazing. amazing. And the fact that he didn't make thousands of records for other bands is incredible. I think he must have just not wanted to. Because he would have had a 311 record or two, you know. But... Well, he did other stuff, but like he should have been one of the most in demand guys ever. And just, just you know. Really book and just looking at some of those track sheets and how these to track share is is mind-blowing and in fact that he used to do their live sound too so he probably would finish an album and then go on tour with them right exactly so he's, he's got time to make another record and he would also take you know multi-tracks with them and they would play to a two-track sometimes for sections because this shit was so intricate so yeah. there's thing, and it wasn't like you know Alan White was playing to a click or something. You're like, okay, here's Why the back of it. Gonna some, there's some orchestra on it or whatever. And and the band was that good that they could play to a, a multi, you know, a two track, a half inch or a quarter inch, or whatever he was doing it from front of house. It was pretty interesting. I, I didn't realize that. That's incredible. So now the two songs I want to ask you about on your perspiration playlist. So this is all stuff you've done. Um, and they're, they're more technical things, really, but I figured, like, everybody's been so cool sitting here. Well, it's because we don't let them talk, but that's why they're, they're sitting there, and they've got lots of technical questions. But two songs on this I wanted to ask you specific things about. So the Chevelle track, Face to the Floor, this is like, it, this happens on so many songs that you work on that are riff-based, where the verse riff and the chorus riff are the same riff. Now, there's a little B section in between, so you do get the kind of break from the riff, but it doesn't, it, it's not like you can count all the extra guitars that came in. The verse sounds awesome, and the chorus sounds absolutely gigantic compared to the verse. And I'm curious, just, is that just mixing of guitars, or is that extra guitars, or things were changed, but it's the same number of guitars, or how was that put together? Do you remember? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm working on Chevelle right now. So for, for me, the, the two things I remember is that song in particular, the first time I heard it, I was like, okay, this is a massive song just because it's a cool, cool riff. Um, so for me, usually, and especially that band, stripping the verse down a little bit, whether it's one guitar or two guitars um, or less volume, a lot of times and then the pre-chorus hits and then the chorus comes in there's usually a jump master fader jump or a, a push because yeah. back, you know i mean i could get volume um we always always leave headroom anyway for mastering guy but the stuff isn't mangled to death so so the verse is there's there's a dynamic range between the verse and the chorus so that's huge doing master fader rides quite a few master fader rides also, I, I do these tracks. I call the enforcers, the Clint Eastwood track, because he's the enforcer. And it's usually one. And it all stemmed from reading an article on ACDC ages ago where, where ACDC was essentially, we all strive to be, I think, ACDC when we're making rock records. We want, want Malcolm on one side, Angus on the other. But then you hit the guitar solo, and what happens? You can't really lay off. So usually at that point, they would use an enforcer, the guitar, the solo track would play all the way out, or the solo track would play rhythm out in the middle or something so in the end it ends up being three tracks and that, that started getting me thinking about because I, I never was into any time i mixed a record where people were quadrupling tracks i'm like this actually sounds smaller this yeah because in the end you end up either playing so tight what's the point or you're editing it to be like two guitars so why not just have two guitars let's go away and yeah yeah, so, so for me, it was always the middle, which makes it tougher to mix because that's where the bass is, that's where the vocal is, that's where the kick and snare is. But you can get these guitar sounds that are inside that middle. So the enforcer comes in there, and there's probably no enforcer on face of the floor in the center. 
But in the chorus, there's guaranteed there's at least one track in the middle fattening up the center. Well, it's it's tucked into the point where you don't notice it, and that it's a masterclass in how to make what is musically basically exactly the same just grow, but not be disappointed when you get back to the second verse either. It's almost like, oh man, this is the cool small version of it again. Well, all the stems from being a three piece, you know, I think a lot of times you're thinking well, it's the singer's playing guitar. So there is a guitar in the middle if you go see the band live. So that that was also, that's always a, a, a key point to me. If I see a band that's four piece or a five piece, usually five pieces, guitar left and right, you know, maybe I'll reinforce parts of the riff with a enforcer guitar. And it's usually the, the section of the riff that the guitar sound is cool for 90% of the song. But that one spot where I'm not going to change guitars or change it, I change the tone a little bit, but I'm not going to punch in one riff with a new guitar sound. That's just stupid to me. That would never happen live. So I just reinforce that riff with another amp or another sound or another performance. But it's 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 really the kind of dialing it in, and it only ha the enforcer never happens until the bass is on. So for me, I cut the guitars first. Because you get a little bit of leeway once there's two guitars in there. There's some out of tune and out of time stuff that, you know, mentally you'd go, okay, I need to fix that. But then you put the bass on, and you're like, okay, it's not really that out of tune anymore. It's actually kind of cool. And yeah. it's a little sloppy, but it's not that sloppy because the bass is in there now. So it just sounds like big. And then, then okay, maybe that riff is a little obscure and, and the bass is really not reinforcing it. Maybe now I'll add the Clint Eastwood track in there. So pretty much except for like tool because tool is really one left and one right there's yeah. really no enforcement at all well um, i want to talk about tool now because that track invincible first of all holy shit i mean the whole album's great but that song and what i noticed listening again because i listened through the whole playlist when you sent it was first of all guitar super stereo the drum kit the toms, hard panned all over the place, really cool, punchy. The the snare, which is, I'm assuming it's a snare where the snare is off, but whatever that drum is. The snare is off for him. Just wants to take your head off all the way through. But the thing that I noticed that was fucking awesome about that mix is that the symbols are mono. They're dead well, sense, basically. So what's the, what's the story with that? Because it works so well. His drum kit because of the nature of you see the drum kit itself. Um, he's got two kick drums and snare in the middle, hat, and then he's got the four toms. One of them's a roto, 9% nine, 9 of the time it's a roto, 90%. Um, some other interspersed drums, but the whole audience view of his drum kit, the whole my right side, his left side of his drum kit is all electronic stuff. So besides the pads that are interspersed on the whole thing, He's got mostly Octopad kind of stuff and hand sonic and things like that. So there's not a ton of stuff on the left side. It's a challenge to get it to be a stereo image in the drum kit. He's got symbols above his, he's got, you know, interspersed, you know, little, we call them Vinnie Colliutas, the little splashes and stuff, and they're all doubled up. And his, his main crashes are in the middle because he's doing such super intricate stuff. And there's a few to the side, but there's hardly anything going on on the left. So I did approach it as a three overhead situation, but most of the symbols are in the center. So that's 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 where they are. It's really awesome because normally you sort of have this picture in your head of the kit like that, low end to top end, where the symbols are kind of the furthest out and the toms are just in from there, or maybe they're wide, and then you get down to the kick drum. But you get this... It's like the attack on the guitar and the attack on the toms, that's the side. And the uh, symbols are like behind the vocal. They're above and behind, like a hat that he's wearing or something. And it's just, it's a great, and obviously it's physically kind of what the drum kit is, but it's, I actually went back, I'm in the middle of mixing a, a record right now, and I went back and took all my overheads and panned them in. And it's, it's so much better, actually. It's incredible how much more air you can make for the guitars without collapsing it all the way into the middle where it messes with the vocal. It's a really cool way to think about it. I think a, a lot of, what happens a lot of times to me is that man, most people don't think, they're like, well, you change the guitar sound. It affects the drum sound or vice versa. Because to me, especially, cymbals and the guitars are in the same area. 
I don't hear the cymbals enough. The guitars are too loud, or maybe maybe they're in the same frequency area, you know. Yeah. So so either darkening them up or moving them in. So rather than EQ stuff, I always talk about you know panning and phase is really the start. So you know, if you've got a floor tom that's just beaten, you know, like always like the Green Day floor tom on the right speaker. But if that's where the chunky guitar is, now you get competition. So make the chunky guitar on the left and the floor tom is not automatically sticking out so that pulling the cymbals in a little bit, especially on his drum kit. Now, if you sit behind a drum kit, he's got very big toms and his his toms go deep to the side. So that's why they're, you know, they're they're a little bit more bold to hear his intricate stuff on this album, as opposed to 10,000 Days, which is a way dirtier, aggressive sounding record to me. This yeah. is a very clean album. Um, but it was also the room was bigger. You know, when you're in a tight room, it's a lot easier to focus those symbols. But I mean, for me, even even stereo rooms are never really stereo. A lot of times they're, you pan them in a little bit. I mean, now so they can hear the floor tom on the right. Now I can hear the guitars better. So. It, it's just the pan pot is your friend, basically. Yes. <laughs> well, I think we better get to some other people's questions because I've monopolized you for the entire time. Um, so I think Mark can come back in, but I want to ask you one of the questions someone did uh, earlier, if I can find it here. Um, lots of people asking about all sorts of stuff, but there was one about when you're tracking drums. Here you go. Uh, is this it? No. Is this it? No. Where'd it go? Did they delete it? It was about like tuning drums and how often will you change drum heads and like, oh, here we go. So how often do you change skins on drums while you're tracking a heavy hitting rock drummer? Many great studio drummers prefer to avoid change of skins unless they're broken or really bad sounding, but usually they have a light touch so they don't kill the heads. What about the harder style? So you talked earlier about Bruce Jacoby coming in as a drum tech. Obviously Mike Fasano has done a bunch of records for you you will have a drum tech if at all possible. And presumably that's because you're not afraid to get in there and say that snare was good for two takes and now it's dead and we got to do something about it. I, that's it right there. I mean, first of all, it's, I mean, here's, here's an interesting story and I won't mention any uh, names, but um, Bruce works at Remo. So he's so familiar with drum heads and style. So I always try to, I mean, if you play a Les Paul, I go, hey man, bring a Les Paul. I'm not going to make you play a Strat, but if your Les Paul's not happening, I'll maybe pick up the strat and try it here. So, so drum drum heads are the same to me. What are you what are you used to using? I'm used to using. So, drummer might say, "I'm used to using this," but the sound I want is this. And live, it's a different beast. You know, I mean, they're they're gating everything because of leakage, and you don't really know what you're hearing live. The the the, the headphone mixers are so EQ'd for clarity and things like. There's so many weird things live. So, having a guy like Bruce or knowing um knowing so much about drum heads he's like well you know the sound that you're looking for and what we're getting in the studio isn't coming across with the head you like to use so he would literally just come in and go hey try this out and change the drum heads completely and i'm like all right that's way better and the drummer usually doesn't have an issue playing another kind of head it's just what they're used to using so yeah you try to have a drum like a guy like bruce and mike that listens John Nicholson was another one, Jerry Johnson's another one. There's so many good guys. That, but Bruce is, because he works at Remo, he's so versed with another UM guy. He's versed with every, like, okay. And and he, being a drum tuner in the studio for years before he started working at Remo, he, he knows all the tricks, you know? He's like, that sound that Joe wants is going to come from this head. And, and they listen, you know? Hey, man, there's, you know, sometimes... You know, kick drum heads, all right, maybe one or two a session, depending on the drummer. But right. you know, the, usually the, the more coated, thinner heads have more tone. And, and sometimes that works. But if you're looking for something that's way more attacky without EQ, you can start right there at the drum head. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's nothing more important than the sound of the instrument you're trying to record and the musician playing it. And to not make the drums sound as much like you want them to be as possible is insane. It's just like, well, I'll deal with it later. You might as well just put some pads out. Well, unless it affects how they play. That's always the thing. You're like, oh, I really like the sound of this kick drum. It's really deep, but the drummer is having an issue playing the drum because it's really deep and he's not used to it. So in that case, 
I always go, hey, man, is anything in your way? Does it feel weird to you? And and drummers are great like that. They're like, yeah, you know, I can mold, no problem. Or I'm doing this thing with my foot, and it's really taxing on my foot because it's not about yeah. that. The thing I've, I've seen a lot is where they're used to playing with no hole in the front head, and you cannot get the sound you want, so you try putting a hole in. But of course, that completely changes the way the beater comes back off the drum, and it's a totally different drum kit to play at that point. So, yeah, you've got. I, I've seen engineers try to change the way the drums are set up, like to get less cymbals in the toms because they want to use ribbons. What can we get underneath there? But, but like even in the case of Danny Carey, who, who on Ten Thousand Days wanted a double head, so how do you get the mic? You need a mic inside. So you end up cutting the XLR off, yep. fish in the hole, hole, out of the XLR back on, you put the mic in, and then you've got to get a sound. And you're like, oh, man, it's not quite right. What do you do? Take the drum head off, move the mic, put the drum head back on, you know? And then yeah. as, as long as you have the, the ability to do that, the money to do that, or, or at least the, uh, the patience for the drummer to have to sit there and go, it's not right, I don't like it, or whatever, or I don't like it personally. Yeah, and I think when we were starting, like it was a bit of a luxury to be able to take time in the studio to do stuff like that. And you'd think, well, now, you know, nobody's got any time, but it also, if you're recording at home or at a friend's house or whatever, you've got nothing but time. And you might have compromises with the room or your mic choices or whatever. So the last thing you want to do is compromise on the instruments. No, the, the instrument is the key. Great bands sound great because they can play, because their sounds are good. And once that's, I mean, that's our, that's our job is done. Basically, we just have to be a fly on the wall and push up some faders. I mean, all those great mixes or broomstick mixes or it was recorded the way you wanted to hear it, you know? So to me, the, back then the decisions were made early on and, and that's a huge, I, I wrote the Mike Stone, one of the greatest engineers of all time, did a bunch of Queen records, did Journey, did Asia. We spent two weeks on a drum sound that was the most phenomenal drum sound I've ever heard with no EQ. And it turned into, here's the drum kit. Okay, let's move it around the room. It's a tiny little room in a guy's house. Let's put it in the corner. Okay, it's good here. Let's put it in the middle. It's okay, it's better here. Oh, now we're going to mic it up. And now these heads don't quite work. We're going to change the head. So everything got changed out. The mics got changed out. Everything that could possibly change got changed out before we reached for an EQ. And, and nowadays, even myself nowadays, like, okay, I got two days to cut the whole record. Get behind the kit, tweak, 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 and there we go, I'll deal with it later. And sometimes that has to happen, but if you can sort it out, like even doubling vocals, you put a mic up and all you own is one microphone. Well, why do 10 tracks of the same vocal in front of the same mic? Even though you have the same mic, move back six inches when you double it. Now you've got part of that room in there. Move yep. back in, turn the mic around, record it on the back side. Now it's got a filtered sound to it move the singer to the other end of the room or in the bathroom. Maybe we did all the Queens of the Lullabies, but it's done all in Sound City Studio A bathroom, all the vocal. Two mics on his mouth, a, 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 a dynamic through a Helios jacked up for gain, uh, um, like an 87 type mic, a large diaphragm for clarity, and then a room mic. And, and so you can blend the three mics and change the sound, but in a bathroom, it wasn't no hi-fi recording. That's because of a bad burrito, right? <laughs> yeah, like he was going to be in there anyway, so might as well get some vocals done. Yeah, that was the haunted bathroom. Nobody wanted to be in there, even with that. All right, Mark, what do you what do you got? Cool. All right. So our first question, voted up fourteen times, was 14. from Florin. Fourteen times. A lot of people want to hear this one. So. Uh, Florian says, Joe, I was always amazed by the snare sound in your mixes. I understand you're playing, you're paying a lot of attention to phase and balance when mixing drums, but is there any other major ingredient like a compressor, pedal, transient shaper, or other type of processing on overhead or direct mics to get that gargantuan punch in the snare? Um, well, I mean, first of all, we say drums are definitely the hardest instrument to record because of, of phase issues. And, um, you know, for me, it's, I mean, if I'm recording it, it's one thing. If I'm mixing somebody else stuff, it could be a different situation. But in general, um, what I would do usually is I tie the drum kit together with a when I'm mixing with a, a stereo 
compressor, a tube text error compressor. So that's my parallel. But I also have a parallel on the snare and a parallel on the kick that are fatteners. So uh, if I need a little more fattening on the drum, I can parallel into a, a different compressor. I have a pair of dynamites for super transient, fast smack and compression. So if I want more of that, I can parallel to that. So basically I'm not really messing with the snare itself a ton, but there are times where I'll actually melt the snare off and put a reverb on it and bring the reverb up in the same channel as the snare. And because the biggest issue with when you when you have a lot of heavy guitars and take up so much space getting some sustain on that snare without putting a ton of reverb on it and then the reverb washes stuff out, it's really difficult. And then once you're putting a snare sample in there that's got reverb on it, that's a whole other issue. You know, and then the fakeness factor of a lot of samples, you spend a lot of time riding those samples to try to make it not sound fake. So a lot of times simply malting the snare off Inserting, I, I like my favorite reverb right now for mono stuff is a, a fab filter reverb. And uh, I'll put a, a short little slap or roomy kind of thing on there and shove it up the same channel, 100% wet. And instead of adding reverb to the snare, I'm adding reverb to the snare in the box by, by you know, malting it off and putting a reverbed snare up the same channel. Um, right. Sometimes there's a sample involved. I mean, honestly, People obsess about samples. Like if I use samples, I can tell you this, I've used the same two kicks and same two snare samples on almost every record that I've had to, if I needed to. And sometimes you can't hear the sample at all. I mean, it's it's a it's a 10% piece of the sound. Sometimes it's to trigger a, re, a reverb. I love uh, XLN, um, Addictive Trigger. It was one of those things where you can actually trigger a room sound, but not the the snare itself and it triggers great. So if I'm if I'm looking for, you know, adding artificial reverb and it sounds fake or weird and my room sounds not cutting it, we're making things too mushy um, or I have to EQ it a ton. I'll sometimes I'll put XLN up and just put the snare up and I'll just mute the actual snare and just trigger some room. And that and that seems to work way better than adding artificial reverb. You know, you can mold it too as well. Right. Um, That's great. Um, Nice. Okay. A uh, lot of questions about drums in here. Um, here's a uh, maybe a quick one. Um, on average, how long do you spend on a mix, and how do you break up your time? Um, I, I'm not a very fast mixer. Uh, I mean, I used to be way faster, but on the average, it's a day a song. Um, mostly because I mean, to me, especially now, it's it's a very um, mental process to me if i don't feel like like i used to track drums and i used to wear my dw drum shirt on day one and that was like a mental thing to me I have to have that drum shirt on when i'm tracking drums because the drum sounds going to be way better and and mixing is a mindset to me and going in and, and being ready to actually mix um because i'm on a console and not completely in the box and i can't really can't do a couple songs at the same time i can prep stuff but um i usually try to keep it on the desk until it's done. It's it's usually a 12 hour day, mix the song, leave it overnight, come in like today, I'm gonna go in and finish the, the song that I did on Saturday, Friday. Um, I mean, the, the, the bulk of it is getting the, the thing laid out and sounding, and the instruments sound right. I usually start with the drums unless it's a vocal song. Um, I, I would say four or five hours into it, especially now being playing off of Pro Tools, I don't have to commit to automation right away. I mean, back in our, our day, we used to, because track sharing, we'd have to get into automation right away, you know, mult this off because the hi-hat over here has a tambourine over here in this section where he's not using the hat or whatever. And we used to do automation right away. But now I just, if I need, you know, something that's going to change sounds or change panning, which is even, even more brilliant about being in a computer, is if the guitar sound is working in the right speaker for 50% of the song and then the left speaker for the other 50, I'll just malt it off and pan it the other way. Who cares? I mean, you would have to automate that back in our day or put it across two faders and turn them on and off. So, yeah. yeah. So I, I spent a good amount of day balancing, really. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. and then when it's ready to go in the computer, it's within two hours of fine tuning and doing some exciting rides and moves, master fader rides. I think it's pretty exciting at that point. And then I'd leave it overnight and come in the next day usually and figure out if it's, was I, if I was crazy or if I was actually correct 
Yeah. Yeah. By the time you turn the automation on, it's to do the checklist of stuff you can't do without automation. Really. Yeah. yeah. Just exciting rides and things. You know, I mean, push this chorus up and. You know, or, or any, I mean, the automated stuff, the panning and stuff is all in the box now anyway. Like, I don't need the pan scan anymore. I don't need it to trigger exactly like this. Right. So that's brilliant, you know. Awesome. Uh, do you find yourself doing your automation in the box or on the console? Both. Yeah. I'll fine tune in the box stuff, but then I like to get behind and go. I mean, I usually am pretty methodical when I, when I put, put the first pass in the computer. Then I'll I'll start thinking about drums and I'll usually turn the vocals off at that point, just listen to the band. And I'll I'll go through and do tom rides and then snare rides into the toms because that's part of the fills and making sure I can hear the kick drums, whether the kick is gonna get higher in the choruses. And then I'll work my way to the right on my desk. Let's do a few bass rides because there's some obvious spots here where the bass is not cutting through, a lot of guitar rides. The solo comes in instead of turning the solo up. Maybe I'm pulling the rhythm guitars back a little, or one side of the rhythm guitars back a little because the solo's on that side. And then I'll put the vocals in and make sure I can hear all the words. And then I'll start thinking about needs a little more excitement in this chorus. Let me push the master fader up here. I want to bring this verse down a little bit. Let me pull the fader down a little here. Mm -hmm. And then at that point, like, you know, those are my excitement moves with my hands because that's, that's some performance to me. The right. performance box is more fine tuning. It's not really that exciting to draw automation in for me. I'd like to push it. But the the, the computer is um, unbelievable for fine tuning stuff. Okay. Awesome. Uh, okay, this one is from Santiago Urad. Uh Sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name. Uh, cool. It is Yes. Uh, so he says, hi, Andrew and Joe. Can you tell us about the drums on Tool's new album? They sound amazing. Do you edit a lot of the close mics or do you embrace the bleed? Um, I can tell you this, we spent a lot of time getting drum sounds, but he is a great drummer. So that's the, that's the key. There's zero editing other than tape editing. We cut it to tape. So we would, I mean, the songs were so long in this particular record, they were cut in sections. So a song like Tempest, for instance, was cut in, in uh, three sections. But the first half of the song is parts one and part two. The middle section, the extended section, actually didn't have a length. It was basically a jam and until the solo was done, and then it became fixed. And then parts four and five. But all the songs were cut like that. And there was there was times where he wasn't using a particular drum, in which case I might say, since you're not using that, I need to turn that microphone off, or let's replace that drum with something that you're gonna hit. So if you want to get a little crazy and put five toms in. Let's replace this with that, or I mean, because you could do whatever you want at that point. So I could swap symbols out, um, you know, change tuning between sections of songs. It didn't really matter. Um, but there's the the biggest issue I had, and a part of the reason it is a little more model than usual is because there's a lot of spot mics on the smaller symbols. Um, mm -hmm. There are mainly three overhead mics, but there's there's a ride symbol mic. There's a hat in the middle, but then there's a whole quadrant of splash symbols that are double stacked. So there's like another six symbols on the left that needed spot mics because in a, in a heavy track, getting to that little splash and making it stick out was pretty rough. You know, there were, you know, some double stack things that don't ring very much because the symbols on top of symbols. So sometimes those needed spot mics. So, you know, being learning the performance, watching the drummer and being able to go, okay, this is going to happen here. I'm going to turn this mic on and off. Because the other thing about it, it all went down to a 24 track tape. So the drums are on 17 tracks. The bass was on three tracks. The guitar is on one. And uh, the vocal was on one. They had time code because I had locked it to uh, make sure the tapes would work. So basically, I'm committing all the drums. The overheads, all the cymbal mics are coming down to left, center, and right on this album. So I'm turning stuff on and off, wow. but not playing it to try to keep it cleaner. Um, yeah. The tops themselves all went down to separate tracks because I knew I needed more control of those, and um, and especially the rototom because that thing just rang the whole time. So I, I did spend a little bit of time with the rototom, making sure the tuning was good, obviously, and then also that it fit in the track with that tuning and and. Um, and trying to duck it out of there when it was howling 
but sometimes that's the beauty. I mean, you know, the listening to old Genesis and yes and stuff like that and the crazy, you mean at least on the Van Halen with all the crazy dragon drums and the octobons and stuff. I mean, those things ring when you're playing. It's part of a drum kit. So getting rid of it all is, is always, is definitely not the key. I mean, embracing it, trying to make it work for you is, is what keeps it real. Awesome. Andrew, you're, you're similar on that respect, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I'm, I'm mixing, I mean, I'm not tracking a whole lot these days. I'm mixing mostly stuff other people have recorded. And I will generally go through and edit the toms so I have a version like that. But I do it just so I can A, B with them uncut. Sometimes I'll do really soft gates. But even that, I've started, like, there's some great plugins like Drum Leveler and the Sonics Drum Gate. Some things that are really, really clever at listening and knowing which drum. But I find that I'm hearing the volume changing. I either want them chopped or I want them wide open. Well, I, I, I definitely go through and automate them instantly. Whether or not I'm going to do them, use them, I like that. So I'll always lower the leakage 20 dB or so and, and leave the drums loud everywhere else they're being hit. But in sections where I'm going, man, I don't hear enough of this, or I don't hear enough ride cymbal well, I'm going to open up those tom mics there. And there are some songs where you're just like, it just doesn't sound right. It sounds too choked up the whole time. I'm going to just get rid of the automation, or I'm going to crank the automation up so it's only 5 dB of, of dipping. You know, so part of that is that they, they were getting those drum sounds with the toms just ringing. So they might think they had enough of the cymbals, but they didn't because the cymbals were in the toms. They weren't in the overheads. Right, exactly. And then that phase relationship between the toms and the cymbals and the snare drum obviously is huge too. So a lot of, a lot of times no one pays attention to that stuff, but putting the toms back up, now your overheads sound better. Right. Or flipping your overheads, maybe now your toms stick out without having to EQ your toms so they stick out. Yeah. Awesome. And like, I've done this a few times where like the room, you're talking about the room before, and it's not really a good stereo picture of the kit necessarily, depending on how it was tracked. But where stuff starts to move and it gets really messy, and I'll actually just like pick the room mic I think sounds best, put it right up the middle with a spatializer thing on it, mm -hmm. and just turn it into more of a reverb, so it's a lot more correlated. And I'm not trying to get this big stereo room thing because it's just the rooms the stuff's tracked in usually now is not necessarily as good or not as much care was taken because there wasn't time or or whatever. But um, that's worked for me quite a bit lately. Yeah, I mean the kick. If the kick is louder in one room, one stereo room, than the other side, and you have this thing going on too that's annoying. That's maybe making your kick drum sound less focused. So, in that case, I would just pick the room track, like you said, put it in the middle. Whether or not you put the stereoizer on it or not, I mean, some sometimes that's cool. Sometimes I, I, I mean, being in a rehearsal room and and listening to a band play live and just going, why does this sound so good? It's mainly because the singer's vocal mic has some reverb on it. You know, so that same kind of picture, putting reverb on that, on that mono room mic, uh, maybe focuses it more than having the stereo room. But sometimes even just tucking it in a little fattens the snare up. You know, that's how you get your fat more sound. Yeah, but I think the the more decisions you can make by panning and volume and muting it, and less processing, especially with multi mic drum kits, the less phase crap you're gonna make. Completely. Completely. Awesome. Uh, here's another one that's really good. Uh, Enrico asks, hi Joe, what's your favorite recording chain for heavy guitars and bass? And do you usually compress and EQ on the way in? Thanks, Joe and Andrew. Um, all right, well, first of all, I'm, I'm a dynamic mic guy because it sounds silly. All the condenser mics are just, you know, whatever. It was like I'm a gonna, full of 87s and that was it, right? Yeah. Even Paul can do it for me. So, wow. I, I use a 57 and 421. If I, I, I usually use multiple speakers and not one, you know, a mic on each speaker. I, I'm like, I'm that guy. I'm not putting two mics on one speaker because to me, there's a phase issue instantly. You have one source, you have two microphones, there's a phase problem. So I put the mic on one speaker, I put another mic on another speaker. If it's a single, cabinet or a single speaker, then I'll just use one microphone and I'll move the microphone. I'll spend a lot of time moving microphones till it sounds right. And even when I think it sounds amazing, then I'll play the track that we're going to record and go, does it sound amazing in this track right now? 
So that's a that's a huge part of it. Um, I bust everything down. I've never recorded anything where I put four microphones on a on a guitar cabinet and put four microphones across four tracks. Everything is bust together, just like on a console, and you pitch it up, and there's one fader. In the case of Tool, I had six cabinets on this last record, off and on, and a Leslie. So he's I recorded his Marshall on one track. We might have had two or three different mics on his cabinet. They all went down to one track. His diesel amp went down to one track. So I can control the two amps that he loves. Mm. I got panned to one side. And then I blended a Bogner and a Rivera down to one track because that was my version of his guitar sound. Then he did whatever. So that all got panned to the left. When he doubled, he went, same, same stuff went to the right. Was it exactly the same? Not, not exactly the same. It's whatever was kind of interesting that worked with it. Another amp, a different amp. Leslie, no Leslie, whatever. Some more room, less room. But for the most part, I mean, like if you look at most of the stuff I track, it's there's two guitars left and right. It's two tracks. The enforcer up the middle. Occasional second enforcer where I might pan it differently. Um, there's never any quadruple guitars ever. And if it is quadruple, it's two fuzzes with some kind of almost blooming kind of low end thing happening that are tucked underneath. It's definitely not intricate guitar playing, so it's so tight that it's it's ridiculous. Um, bass is the same thing to me. I'll experiment with more large diaphragm stuff on bass, but a lot of times well, nowadays I'm recording a DI and a clean amp and a dirty amp. The clean amp is always the more hi-fi version, punchier, 47 fed, large diaphragm, whatever it is you've got. Um, sometimes it's a 421. It just seems to work. I, I tend to favor the dirty mics. Uh, uh, my dirty bass sound is usually a 57 in front of a 4x12. It works. People laugh at that. They think, is that has a bass sound? Why is it a 57? Huh? I'm looking for dirt. I'm looking for the nose that's cutting through. But more importantly, I'm using a DI for my low end. And I'll swap out DIs on every song if that's what it takes. You know, listening to different DIs and the kind of low end that come through them. Some DIs are very articulate. So on songs that sound like, you know, you're playing like Getty Lee bass. The articulate DI works great, whereas the flubby low end bass doesn't work, you know, DI doesn't work as well. So it, that's a that's a huge part of it to me. And it's always that balance of the three in mixing. And then nine out of ten times I'll reamp the bass as well, just to have something in the track that might add a little glue, a little distortion, or malting the bass DI off and adding like Renaissance bass sometimes for some sub or turning on and off a chorus or whatever, you know, being able to do that in the box is great. So, yeah, you're, I mean, the, you're, uh, you're known for, for stuff like that, like uh, experimenting with different DIs and, and all that, and like in your downtime, which I don't know when you find downtime. But, uh, I, you know, like, here's uh, here's what happens. I have my friend Bill Molina is my partner in crime. And usually he's like, all right, I've got these Austrian audio microphones. I want to check them out. All right, cool. And we come over and the next thing we know is we're like eight hours later, scientific lab coats out. Okay, we're going to measure the distance between the speaker and the guitar. We try to play the same or reamp the same signal. And that's how you learn, man. That's how you make your decisions. I don't want to have to learn when I'm getting paid high dollar, high pressure situations. Hey, check out this microphone. You know, I want to go in knowing this seemed to work in this situation. Not that it always is going to work in that situation. I mean, reamping a guitar and listening to 18 different microphones, I might make some decisions saying this mic sounds great, but does that mic sound great in a track that I'm recording right now with this other guitar part playing? Maybe not, but, but at least knowing, knowing what hammer to use is really the key. Well, yeah. and to the end, I mean, you have fishing, fishing tackle balls full of picks. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that, that's what you're talking about. Kits, right? and yeah. That Joe actually had a favorite pick for Guitar Hero. I did. The man knows his guitar gear. Well, I do, we do these classes, my pro sound workshop thing. One of the things we do when we teach the guitar classes, I'll just sit there and I'll play guitar and I'll have a dozen picks. And I'll sit there in front of his, you know, small classic kids and go, all right, hear that, hear that, hear that. Is anybody hearing a difference? And Nine out of ten people will just be in awe that you can change a guitar sound instantly by changing your pick. And there's always, when we're cutting guitars and bass, there's always a, a whole slew of picks laid out in front of the console. 
And uh, and a lot of times they're like, hey man, because I'm on Evil Joe picks because you know why not? You know I thought it was kind of funny that guys had picks with their studio name on. I was like, I'm gonna have an Evil Joe pick. So Dunlop made me some Evil Joe picks actually. That's right here. And uh, they say Evil Joe on them, and there's a skull, and it's uh, anyway. You get the idea. But that is awesome. <laughs> Yeah, is, uh, you know, I mean, you can come in and have your nylon pick or whatever it is that you normally love, and I'm great, but sometimes you hear stuff when you're playing guitar, and you're like, oh, that note's not sticking out as much, or these notes are so bright that they're ringing together, and I have to EQ the guitar different to make it work. Just try picking up a different pick for a second, and nine out of ten times, a guitar player pick up a pick and go, oh, this actually sounds better for this part. How, how you know, crazy is that to do live? They're not going to do it live. But in the studio, why not? I mean, on, on some records, I've changed strings. Like even on this last Tool record, Justin changed bass strings for a section of a song because we were we were getting the notes to work right while we were cutting the track. And um, and in the end, I was like, hey man, let's try some ground wounds, you know? So we we put some uh, some ground wounds, excuse me. So like like partially flat, they're flattened a little bit, they're a little bit duller. And for the part that he was playing at the time, they didn't poke out as much and the notes didn't obscure each other. And so is he gonna actually pick up a new bass with a different set of strings on it live? No, he's gonna sort of play it live. It's gonna sound great. But band stops, hold on, I gotta get a bass for the bridge, one second. Doesn't matter, you can do whatever. You, know, you get two squeaks. We try a set of elixirs, and then you know, elixirs are interesting. They last forever. Do I do I use them on everything? No, but for stuff that's really squeaky, sometimes they're really they're great. Hmm. So, Mark, one more from you, and then one from me, and we'll, we'll great. finish this. We're way over here. Awesome. I'm really awesome. Okay, um, I liked. Uh, let's see. There is one in here. This is pretty interesting. Uh, so it says, "Hi, Joe." This is from Santiago again. It says, "Hi, Joe." Uh, sorry, I just scrolled on me. Where to go? Uh, he was asking about. Okay, amazing vocal sound on Soundgarden's "King Animal." Can you talk about that? Uh, how was your experience working with the great Chris Cornell? Did he record the vocals the usual way that he did by placing the monitors out of phase in the control room? No. Um, so first of all, um, Adam Casper produced the record and he recorded most of it. I got it when um, they were, you know, they were into it so deep at that point they didn't really know what they had. So basically they sent me the drives and said, can you listen or whatever? And so I went through every song, I'd get some rough mixes up on my console and make notes of every song. And then basically Chris came in and um, and we just said, oh, what do you want to work on? And, and we would just tackle a song. And he definitely, he sent his, his normal chain, which was a 67 and a Neve module 1073. And uh, um, I don't know if it was an 1176, and an LA2A or just an 1176. And I had all that stuff, but he sent his mic. So having his own mic was the one that they used on the album that Adam had picked out. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that was that was a bulk of it, but Chris was really, was really uh, creative. Um, and, he, and he was very um, good at recording himself as well at home. Got a studio set up, he used Logic. Um, he'd worked with Alan Johannes on his solo stuff, on his first solo record and got really into more ribbons and more unique sounding microphones and so he used to record with uh, also had an octava microphone it's kind of a flat looking black microphone it's kind of their version of a 421 but um that was a big part of his distorted vocal stuff but he was i mean so so basically that's where we'd start but at, at the same time it's just when you have a good singer, it doesn't matter what they're singing in front of. Like literally, if I didn't have that 67, he felt comfortable with it. And he sounded great on it. But there are other mics that I put up in front of him just to vary the sound a little bit from song to song. Mm -hmm. and, and I didn't redo all the vocals. I just did stuff. Sometimes it was a bridge. Sometimes it was a chorus. Sometimes he wanted to fix a line or two or re-sing it or change the words. So I'd have to match the sound that was there. Mm -hmm. um, but he was great. Great to work with. Super happy. Gave my dog additional vocal credit when my dog was howling in the, on the cow while he was singing. <laughs> nice. uh, very inspirational. Um, yeah. I, I, that, that made a crazy story because there was, there was a, a, a song that I thought needed a, a guitar solo and I would say to Chris, hey, why don't you just pick it up, play guitar? And he's like, no, man, I can't do it. He's the soloist. 
So the next day I'd come into the studio early and I'd put up the rain song on, you know, I'd grab my Dan Electro, long, uh, not Longhorn, but a convertible, tune it like the rain song, try to YouTube learn the rain song instantly and some crazy open tuning. And then I'd put the guitar on the couch and then Chris would come in and um, he'd say, hey, what's that guitar? I'm like, oh, it's, it's in this rain song tuning or whatever. You know, and he'd sit on the couch and listen back to some stuff. And before you know it, being a great musician that he is, he would pick up the guitar and he'd start playing some cool solo and I'd record it and this solo would be done. And just having that inspiration going on, you know, always being ready to record. And, and in a way, psychologically, you know, I knew he was eventually going to pick the guitar up because he's that musical. I've seen him live. We can start a song hang on a second, retune it, play it in a whole different open tuning, not even thinking about it, that brilliant, instant. And and what a great thing to too, because my dog, a lot of times, if he sat on the couch and sang, my dog would, my last dog, Bullet, would come over and start howling with him. <laughs> and shit, man, I ruined the recording. And then the album came out, and I'm looking at the credits, and I see additional vocals, Bullet, on <laughs> Black Saturday, because my dog is like, <laughs> <laughs> Awesome, man. Well, awesome. Thank, thank you so much for doing this, Joe. I got one question, which is just relevant to the times we're living in right now. When all the restaurants reopen, where's the first place you're going and what are you ordering? Well, what we were making, uh, the tool record, there was this place called Dave's Hot Chicken and uh, on Western, and it was pretty awesome. There's just there's too many, man. Just Jitlada, they got the the mango sticky rice, so good. There's a new Thai place that opened up down the street, but we're all gonna eat like three weeks every night. Oh yeah, yeah. for your local businesses now, though, man, it's it's sad what's going on. Obviously, I've been shopping for you know dog biscuits down the street, and obviously trying to be safe about it and wearing masks and not getting too crazy. But it's it's sad to see. I mean, we could kind of still work because we're working in isolation most of the time, but the restaurant, the Thai restaurant that just opened up down the street and, and it, you know, a grand opening and a week later having to shut everything down. I, I can't yeah. even imagine the monetary outlay to get everything going and people working and all of a yeah. not that income. So um, I would support the most local all right. stuff. Awesome, man. Thank you so much for this. This is Thanks. great. Uh, it's always good to see you. Hang out. So... <laughs> <laughs> that was the way we're doing it. Give my best to your family. Thank All right, man. You for questions and uh, and Mark for your um, um, governing over us. <laughs> my pleasure. Thank you so much for doing this. So uh, we'll be back again next week with Andrew for another Andrew Sheps talks to awesome people. Greg Greg Wells and Nina Woodford Wells, the uh, the couple, the songwriting force that is awesome. the two. Of them. Cool. Awesome. Joe, thank you for doing this and for all of your contributions to what we do. Awesome, man. <clears throat> Thanks, Thanks for having me. Bye, guys. Bye.